we set out to be a melodic punk band that had horns, but also dabbled in ska. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Less Than Jake is a ska punk band from Gainesville, Florida, who started in the 90s. Now, I have, I was going to do like a big intro to this and talk about who Less Than Jake is and all the things they've done, but if you're listening to this podcast right now and you don't know who the fuck Less Than Jake is, then you should probably go listen to something else. One of the reasons why I'm going to keep this intro short as well is because I got to it late today, and this is the day before I'm launching it, and I just... Uh, I just don't feel like doing a long fucking intro, and I think the people who want to listen to this episode just want to fucking dive into it, so we're going to just go into it. But I will say real quick that Less Than Jake was a band that I was fucking obsessed with in my late teens. I had heard of them through, I think it was Alan Rappaport who who told us about them, and somehow we got our hands on Pezcore, and I, and I remember getting Pezcore, I think from the Hot Topic in Rockway Mall. And I bought it there, and when I started listening to it, I was just like, this is one of the best fucking albums I'd ever heard. It was just so many songs that just, I don't know why I connected with it. I think it was just like the, the style, the the lyrics, the Chris's voice, uh, just the energy in the songs, Roger's voice also. So these guys really helped define the late 90s for me. Like, I mean, they were up there. It was like these guys and Mineral and Jimmy Eat World and MXPX and just like all these fucking bands. And um, so, yeah, so even though I was going to keep it short, that was kind of long, but I ended up reaching out to Vinny through someone gave me his email and I emailed him and uh, he said, yeah, and I was beyond fucking stoked that he said, yes. Yeah. So I got him on the phone and this is what we talked about him currently stepping away from touring, growing up in Jersey. How was less than Jake embraced when they started out? What influenced them to write ska songs, getting on Asian man, the Alan Rappaport pool party, which Alan had actually asked me in the Facebook group, uh, the North Jersey pop punk group. If, we talked about this, so yes, Alan, we did talk about this. How has Jersey treated them throughout their career, the losing streak, hidden track, and a ton more? As always, before we begin, this week's episode is sponsored by my animation company, Drive80. If you're in a marketing company and you're in need of someone to turn your graphics into videos, then check out my website, drive80.com, to see some of my work. A lot of this stuff does not take me that long. It can take me an hour, it take me four hours, and uh, you should just send me your shit, and I can do it. And then that's it. The end. Great. If you'd like to support the podcast directly, you could just donate as little as a buck a month through a Patreon page by going to thiswasthescene.com and clicking on the button at the top of the page. It says click here for bonus material. This means you'll be paying 12 bucks a year, which means a dollar a month. And that's every month a dollar gets taken out of your account and put towards the podcast. So if you want to do that, awesome. If you don't want to do a dollar a month, you could just do a one-time donation with the donate button that's on top of thiswasthescene.com, the button that says donate. You can donate whatever you want to. That really helps out with this thing. And uh, that's all I have to say. Feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. Thank you for doing this and for all the uh, technical difficulty crap that we've uh, gone through to have this happen. No worries, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, it's actually I I didn't know. So I was doing research. I mean, I I I was like huge Lesson Jake fan. Like you know, I started like heard of you guys in the '90s and got Pez Core and Losing Streak and just was just you know always listened to the fuck out of those albums. And uh, so I was just doing some extra research on some stuff. And I saw that uh, you just left the band, so I was like, "Holy shit!" I didn't. The timing on that was crazy. That I was literally going to talk to you at this. I'm not. I don't want to talk. You don't have to like go into depth about it, but it was just. I was like, "Holy crap!" Like literally this week, you had announced it or something like that. Yeah, you know, for me, uh, man, uh, me and Chris started the band, and that was 27 years ago. And then, in, in real lesson Jake form, it's been 26 years, right? So that year is like in and out of my mom's back in my mom and dad's back room out of the house and demoing songs. He would come home from the weekend. He was away at college in Gainesville. I was still living down uh, a few hours South in Port Charlotte. He would come home and see his parents and we would write songs and and go for that. But uh, flash to 27 years of just sort of having that just be the forefront. Just, I, 
wanted to step away from touring. So yeah. uh, I do band social media and a lot of the manager, you know, the managerial stuff and, you know, merch and the web store and, and all these things for less than check, which is I'm still going to do. And I'm still doing, uh, uh, just married and I have a seven year old. So, uh, leaving now six months out of the year, uh, after 27 years, it's just, it, it's time to kind of step away from the touring side of it. Still be in the band and still just not be a touring member. And I, you know, people either have been treating me two ways, right? Uh, either treating me like I'm dead, which is, uh, you know, my condolences, you know, you had a good run. I'm like, well, I don't even know what you're talking about. I mean, that's cool that you're saying that, but uh, you're treating me like I've, I've, I'm, I'm living dead at this moment, which is uh, totally odd. Or, you know, you have a bunch of other people who, and specifically dudes in bands who, and that are married and with, uh, a kid or kids and have been going, you know, fuck, uh, uh, good for you because, yeah. you know, uh, I, I, I get it that what you want to do and that's good that you can do that. So, uh, supportive and, and, and weird and it's all those things, but at the same time, it's all the same things that I've been doing. If you talk to me a year from now, maybe I will go, yeah, it's been a totally weird year, but, uh, Right now, a few weeks in, uh, it feels totally normal. I just am not touring, which is uh, good and bad at the same time. Yeah, I mean, you're still alive, and you can. People yeah, just think <laughs> it, it's just like people think that when a band, you know, in this case, it didn't happen, breaks up, but if a member leaves, back then it was that's it that it's set in stone you are out we are not you're not in the band anymore or we are not a band anymore and i think from all these reunions and even old members coming back in a band like anthony green coming back in aseos and things like that um it's it's like you can change your fucking mind <laughs> like you say like a year from now you can say hey guys like maybe i want to go out with you guys for a couple weeks and they're like okay or you know you guys can still record albums together it's like it doesn't have to just be that cut and dry format if someone just doesn't want to do it for a while like people can change their minds well yeah i mean it's never it's you know the world isn't black and white the world's a a totally shades of gray and and with with less than jake it's a a, always a shade of gray you know uh it's a, a drummer who writes lyrics that's weird you know and and uncommon but uh so it's so my life of 27 years is so intertwined with what the band is and who the band is that it, it's hard to just kind of go, well, that's it. I'm, I'm cruising, you know, yeah. uh, later. So it, it, life, life goes on, you know, creative life goes on and, and less than Jake life goes on and it's good to still continue to push, uh, this, this very large glacier forward you know and it's it's not necessarily goodbye it's a goodbye to people who i only see on tour but at the same time uh, uh you'll probably be the one that i'm talking to uh if you're messaging on any social media so uh very all very weird but you know uh f- figuring it, f- yeah just figuring it out uh, as we go along so yeah yeah, it's not like everyone. I don't think I've met anyone who just has the complete answers to anything. It's just it, you know, you just make a decision for that yeah. point, and then moving, you moving forward, you're like, oh, it, you know, it's it's not just like this always. And it's funny too because uh, I was looking at your your Facebook page, and it's just so many people are just having these giant statements and tagging you and tagging you. It's like you just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. They're like, you know, just saying their goodbyes or like their well wishes and things like that on your page. I'm like, holy crap. Yeah. That's got to be wild. Hey, yeah. It's got to be nice. It's it, also it, got to be it, a little bit like overwhelming at the same time. It, it, it's both. It's both of those things. And for me, I, I'm, you know, Les and Jake fans have always been a great, great people, man. Always been supportive, always been passionate about what we do. And it's awesome. Uh, it's overwhelming just because I don't feel any different and I'm not acting any different than what I've been doing for the last 27 years. I just happen to not be playing that hour 
uh, a night. Yeah, you somewhere know? in and, like America or the world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, my other twenty three hours of the day has plenty filled with less than Jake. So uh, for me, it, it doesn't feel that odd. For other people, it feels extremely different. But uh, for me, I'm just kind of going and doing what I've always done, which is, you know, support less than Jake and try to continue to, you know, uh, push it forward. Well, it, I thought it was kind of cool, not cool timing. That's so it was, it was interesting timing because I talk about in these interviews, the origins of the band. So it's, it's crazy to at this very point where, you know, you had, you were leaving, you left the band for the, for whatever the time is right now. It could be forever. It could just be for the, the moment, but, um, and it kind of caps it on that end, but I want to go all the way back to the beginning and I want to go a little bit before, or probably a lot before you even created the band and talk about just in general, um, what got you personally into loving music as like a kid? Well, you know, my parents, music was always in the house, right? So, um, my mom and dad on Saturday and Sunday, you know, I, I get up on a Saturday they would have been up for a while, but they'd be sitting around and they'd be listening, <clears throat> listening to records, you know? And back then, you know, my dad and mom both, they liked, you know, Neil Diamond and, yeah. uh, Robert Streisand and Kenny Rogers and, and go figure. But I mean, that was the seventies. So, uh, I would get up and then be listening to records and uh, my mom would make me breakfast when I was young. And, uh, my dad would, you know, we'd talk about the music that was playing and I'd ask questions and he'd sing along and my mom sing along and they dance in the kitchen. And it's awesome. those things that are, are, are embedded in my brain, you know, and if they go back uh, decades and decades and decades ago. So, uh, that's what got, you know, sort of kicked me off on, on the love of music. And when my brother wanted to start playing guitar, I was like, I want to play guitar too. I want to, you know, I want to do that. My brother went, well, we can only have one guitar player in the house. You know, you need to pick another instrument. So uh, I picked drums and my parents were super supportive of uh, the noise that was made and the fights that would happen and uh, the music and the friends that would come over to play music and listen to music. And uh, always, always, both parents were always uh, incredibly supportive of what uh, I was doing and thinking when it when it came to music and when it came to music in my life. So it was great. Did you did you like kind of have a, a mini band with your brother? Did you guys play together? Uh, no, because we brought, my brother liked you know uh, different type of rock and roll, and I always when I first started to kind of find my own music it wasn't it was decidedly different than what my brother was listening to you know it's like if my brother was listening to let's say ELO right or Queen hmm. and uh, as an uh, adult I, I love both of those bands and I love uh, you know a lot of the records and songs that they've done but uh, for me like as you know a preteen I go, well, like if my brother likes Queen, then I have to like something completely opposite, you know? Yeah. And if, if my brother was the de facto sort of mayor of metal in, in the town that I grew up in, New Jersey, right? So, you know, he liked everything, uh, you know, Motley Crue and, and Twisted Sister and all that. And again, I, I like that and I, I grew up around it. But uh, when I was trying to find my own self, I knew that it couldn't include what my brother was listening to. So I found different stuff, you know, and yeah. kind of landed, uh, landed a little bit harder, a little bit harder music, like thrash metal is, is what I landed on first, which is, you know, Slayer and Celtic Frost and uh, Venom and Exodus, uh, early Metallica. Those, those are the things that I landed on when I was younger. And because that was my music and, uh, and, and as time went on, I wanted music that was faster and angrier, and, and I wound up finding punk rock uh, uh, through, weirdly enough, my brother, which uh, was also listening to New Wave at the time, uh, Blondie and The Knack and, and B-52s and things like that. Uh, and 
that shared that new wave in, in New Jersey where I grew up, we were bridge and tunnel kids to New York city. So new wave shared kind of the same spaces, early punk rock, you know, uh, Ramones yeah. were my gateway, yeah. you know, Ramones were my gateway to punk rock. Right. So, uh, I kind of found it through my brother and then I just went beyond it because I wanted something faster and angrier. And that went into, you know, misfits and, uh, bad brains and, uh, DRI, uh, fear and, and keep on going. I could go forever. What did you like about that? Actually, real before I asked that, where in New Jersey did you grow up? I just always thought you grew up in Gainesville. Uh, Woodbridge, New Jersey, is no where shit. I grew up. Holy crap! I didn't know. Yeah. I grew up in um in Jefferson. Uh, I don't know, like Rockway yeah. Mall. Do you remember? Do you remember? How well? How how long were you in Jersey? Actually, you could have been there for till sixteen. Oh no shit! Wow, Jesus, I, didn't, I totally didn't know that. Um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah uh, it's cool because like the majority of people listening to this are all like from Jersey, so they're probably gonna love that. Um, yeah. What what about? like the punk bands that you started listening to, did you have one of those moments where, or like you said, the Ramones were the gateway. Was there a moment when you just heard a Ramones song after growing up listening to your parents' records where you heard the Ramones and all of a sudden there was this, holy shit, that's something that totally got my, that that's, that's going to take me in a new direction because of this. Well, you know, it's a, you know, the first, I'll go with the first record that I ever bought was a Kiss record, right? Okay. And it was Kiss Alive, and everyone, I was a preteen, everything about that was great, right? It was fire and makeup and like crazy swords and smoke. And like, as a preteen, I was like, this is, this is it. Right. And, uh, as I started to find more music and sort of faster music and things like that, and that was what I was sort of tuned into. Uh, I remember watching rock and roll high school, the movie, okay, and it had the Ramones in it. And, you know, if you're, dude, if you're from New Jersey, then you understand there's a few things that you have in music, in your musical pedigree, uh, no matter what other type of music you like, you like the following, you like Bon Jovi, you like Bruce Springsteen and you like the Ramones. And for me, that was, that was it. Right. And I saw rock and roll high school. I had friends that went, Oh my God, did you see this? And we talked about it and, uh, Ramones were my gateway because my brother was at that point was liking metal, but also liking sort of like new wave things. And he would go to, you know, concerts of that sort of shared that, that headspace and found the Ramones. And it was through that movie. And at, when I was watching that movie, I was like, yeah, this is it, man. Like, you know, the, the characters that were in the movie as the Ramones, right. Uh, yeah. They were the Ramones, but they were playing, you know, sort of the characters of the Ramones. And that was it. Like, you know, hey, they're wearing blue jeans and leather jackets and they're talking about pizza. And yeah, this is this is this is it for me. <laughs> so when you were 16, is that when your parents moved you down to Florida or 17? Yes. OK. Yes. So up that up until that point, you're growing up in New Jersey and 16, you're in like what? 10th grade? 10th grade. So in 10th, 10th grade, grade. so are you dressing like this too then? I uh, yeah, I I was full, full on punk rocker man like uh, and uh blue jeans, leather jacket, you know, Converse and you know, shaggy hair and uh you know, tried and studs and everything. I mean, that that was I was a teenage pesher, you know, and that's what I looked like, but listening to punk rock and kind of headed down that path of, you know, with music, the same music that I was discovering, I definitely was heading down that path to look, I was looking much like my heroes were at the time. So when you got down to Florida, you obviously are showing up in the middle of your high school years, at this brand new school dressed like this. And like, that's going to be a giant magnet to find like your, well, your friends, right? Well, here's the thing. When, when I got to Florida, I, you know, my parents were like, you have to not dress like this. It has to be, <laughs> you know, this, this sort of, it's a new school. So please, you know, just like have it. And I was in Venice high school and I was just in a t-shirt and I was in, uh, you know, pants and, it, you know, just regular jeans or whatever. And I went, you know, sort of invisible for, you know, a few weeks. And then when I brought out the overkill shirt, 
and a misfit shirt and I just wore that on like, you know, a, a, another day, that's when people are like, who are you? And why do you have like this misfit shirt? And, and that got me into, you know, a, a different headspace. And for a new school where I was at, uh, there was surfers and skaters and those two groups of people were also the punk rockers, right? Yeah. So for me, that led, you know, led into a whole nother world of California punk rock, which I had no idea about, right? Mm, okay. That was JFA and, and uh, Faction and uh, Descendants uh, go down the, you know, go down the list of SST and cruise bands at, at the time, right? Uh, and, you know, go back even more, Germs, uh or another one, uh, Circle Jerks, Bad Religion, The Weirdos, all of those things uh, I found through <clears throat> when I moved down to Florida because surfers and skaters, they were sort of, you know, jockeying the California culture in Florida. So uh, that included, you know, what you were listening to. So was it in high school that you met, like who in less than Jake did you meet first? Was it, was it, you said Chris in the beginning of this interview, was it, was he the first person you met? Uh, well, you know, uh, I was going to Venice High School. Uh, I got kicked out of Venice High School, and then I started going to Port Charlotte High School, and that was uh, 11th grade. Wait, wait, why'd, and you, get, then why'd, you, met, why'd you get kicked out? I, you know, it's, uh, I, I was drinking, so okay. and I drank too much, and I got caught. So, okay. uh, which is weird, but... <laughs> uh, I, I could actually, you know, talk about an hour on just that, but we're not going to. Like, we're going to stick to the, the music. But, hey, I got time if you uh, do, dude. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I met Chris when I started going to a uh, new high school, uh, but I didn't meet him right away. But uh, I had different bands and different punk bands and different things like that. But I wanted to do something that was a little bit more melodic. Chris was doing like sort of like a weird a uh, rock band, but kind of singing some punk rock covers too, and uh, wanted to start a new band. So through mutual friends, I started to talk to Chris, and <clears throat> I had just, I was in a band called Good Grief, and that broke up. Uh, so I hit Chris up, and then we started a band together, and that was Needless Guilt. Okay. Uh, and Needless Guilt was cool, you know, and uh, it was fun and it was a, a bit melodic and a bit, you know, sloppy. And it was everything that a punk rock band in, you know, the late eighties, uh, was supposed to be right. Uh, but after that, Chris, you know, he had graduated high school and he was going up to Gainesville. So for me, you know, needless guilt ended and then good grief started again. Uh, and we were just in the middle of that. Then he started to come home and we started writing songs. And that was the, the sort of, uh, the, the, the spark that started worse than Jake, where he was, you know, up in Gainesville. I was still down a few hours South in Port Charlotte and we just started writing songs and, uh, they started to form pretty quickly, to be honest with you. And I just had, I was home going to, uh, Manatee Community College and then I had decided hey you know uh, let me try to get into University of Florida and I tried and failed uh, <laughs> but then I got into Santa Fe Community College and they were like look if you do one semester here you can transfer over to University of Florida right after that you just need you know uh, a little bit extra curriculum before you can go to the university so I did that and, and started on, you know, started at the University of Florida, but I was up in Gainesville. And then that's truly when Less Than Jake became a band. We started to find other people to play with. We started to bring in the vibes that we were listening to at the time, which was the Doughboys. And it was <clears throat> a snuff, a band from England, which is yep. a huge influence on Less Than Jake uh, early on. Okay. Uh, and uh, Operation Ivy, and it's when we discovered Lookout Records. So it was Screeching Weasel and Op Ivy, Isocracy, 
It was Sweet Baby. Those are the bands that we started to listen to and started to go, well, if, if this can happen somewhere else and they're just like kind of uh, the same age as us, this, we could do this too. And they were out on tour. And we could be out on tour too. So immediately when you started a band back then, you, were, you started the dream of how we, you know, we could go play shows out of town and to new people. And then once you did that, you started to go, oh, we could be on, you know, a weekend we could go away for. And then once you do that, you start to go, oh, this could be, you know, we could go on tour for a few weeks and we can book it. And uh, Maximum Rock and Roll, which was a magazine at the time, and I think it's still around, but I, I don't really read it. It's uh, outside of a sort of like the circle of things that I, I like and enjoy. But at the time, Maximum Rock and Roll was my life. And they started to do uh, a separate magazine called Book Your Own Fucking Life. Yeah. And it had all of the punk friendly things that were around the United States and beyond uh, promoters that promoted, you know, out of town bands and record labels and just, you know, d distribution channels and everything under the sun that if you were a young band, you could book, you know, your first tour or second tour or third tour or whatever it was. Uh, so we got that and we started to go at it, you know, and, uh, well, did you guys like a, uh, what, what? Yeah, but like, how many shows did you actually play locally before you just went for it? A lot. Yeah, you like, know, did you? Was, was it? Oh, were you just based in Gainesville and just blowing up there? Like, did you? Your like your first show? Like, did you? <laughs> were, I mean, you know, not like first show. Everyone's first show. Uh, yeah, first show. Every everyone's first show is terrible. Oh, you know, awful. and everyone's second show is terrible, and. Uh, Less than Jake is a, a weird, unique entity in the way of locally, punk rockers really didn't like us. No shit. You know, because we were pushing, you know, we were pushing the boundaries of of genre bending at the time, right? So we were adding ska and we were adding horns and we were playing, you know, melodic sort of East Bay and Chicago uh, influenced pop punk. And people just... You know, to be honest with you, the the local punks just uh, weren't feeling it. You know, and uh, some punk rock bands that were around, Spoke, which was one, Bombshell, which was another, Wordsworth. We played with those bands, but no one really, uh, no one really was feeling it. You know, it was, you know, it was a hard, it was a hard push to get through the local punk scene here, but. Uh, we kept on playing, but we kept on, you know, sort of appealing to other people. So we were bringing new faces and new sort of energy that weren't from the punk rock scene into punk rock club or called the hardback. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And, and, and that was, and that was a, a very, a very cool thing. So no uh, hardback, uh, Alan Bushnell is, is who owned it at the time and, and sort of book in bands and all that. He wasn't mad at us because we were bringing, you know, new blood and, and a and a different vibe and a fun vibe to uh, the local punk scene. So it was okay by him, and it was cool by us that we had a place to call our own, you know. But uh, Les and Jake, <clears throat> we ran parallel to the Gainesville punk scene, uh, and sometimes dipping in and dipping out and dipping in and dipping out, but uh, we weren't embraced by by that the the local scene as much as we were starting to create our own scene so you guys like did you did you guys sit down and say look like we know we're going to school and all that but we just as a as a collective really just want this thing to work like let's fucking go for it did you have that conversation that, that was that was after we already knew i mean uh you know all of a sudden we were you know we were ben and we were drawing you know uh decently in uh decently in Gainesville but it wasn't until we went to Daytona and we played at this place uh called Black Eyed Susan that you went wow people know who our band is you know and it that's when you started to put together that the pieces are falling falling uh more easily together uh, outside of Gainesville, we were showing up to places outside of Gainesville and had more people than on the Gainesville shows. And it was one of those moments that it went, 
wow, this is this is crazy. And by the time we we stuck to uh, doing you know weekend shows, and then we had a you know summer tour that was forty eight days, and then we had <clears throat> a winter tour when the winter break was for college. It wasn't until uh, after Pescor came out that we went, hey, you know, this is something that we can do, you know, for real. and We need to push into it, you know. So some of us were uh, graduating from your bachelor, you know, with a bachelor's degree in college. Others were still working on things. And collectively we went, we should we should try to make this real and, and push into it. Because you guys started in 92, and then you got signed to, because uh, it was, actually, I just uh, interviewed Mike right before your interview from Asian Man, and was yeah. was was it Dill that put out Pescor first, and then it, be- it, was, or no, it was Asian Man, right? Yeah, there, it was Dill, and That's then right. he left Skank and Pickle, yeah. and he started Asian Man, so he took, I think, three records uh, with him, which was, I think, slapstick ours and something else i forget what it was okay so like before that though for those three years when you're playing and you're touring around i mean again this is like early 90s where it was right before the scene really hit i think like 96 97 was this like beginning of this where it really started to blow up and everyone started to really kind of i i mean that's when i got into it in like 96 97 and i was just big yep. i walked into legion halls and there was just hundreds of kids i'm like wow these guys must have heard of this fucking way before i did so but between 92 and 95 did was that like how was the local scene in the places you went to like in toured to dude it, it, it was great it was yeah. it was you know people were finding punk rock music uh and punk rock music became you know it was a very dangerous place late 80s and in the early 90s but it started because you know the the more melodic punk rock music became, the more sort of it depends on who you talk to. Yeah. The more watered down it became, as far as uh, the anger and and people that it drew, you know. So it became a lot safer of uh, a place, and punk rockers were a little bit more savvy and becoming a bit more savvy about inclusivity and about you know welcoming outsiders and about supporting their scene and about. Uh, just the general headspace of, hey, this is this is something that we we we're welcoming everybody. You just don't have to have, you know, uh, or look like us or have the pedigree of us. You can show up. Anyone could show up, and it's okay. Well, I think you guys also opened the door for that because you had like your songs were just really. I mean, I remember listening to Pezcor. And I, I, mean, I fucking loved it. I fell in love with it right away because it was it was fun. It was you you can like yell the words, but it was also like really inviting, and it wasn't intimidating by any way, you know. And I, I so I think like you guys definitely opened that door for people to step into the scene and be like, all right, this is inviting. It's not you know it's not all black flag and you know showing up and get my ass handed to me at a show. Yeah, you know, but it's crazy because at the same time that, you know, Less Than Jake was was doing what we were doing, there was a whole nother aspect of things that were, you would get your ass handed to you if you were showing up at those shows, you know? Yeah. A lot like, of New York hardcore was yeah. out on tour and a lot of those things, you know, that still maintained a lot of the same, you know, uh, violent tendencies and, and anger sort of issue, right? And... I got, but I, you know, it's weird. It's, I still got and understood those things, you know, and I still liked a lot of the bands at the time. Uh, you know, Agnostic Front was one of those bands, and Crumb Suckers, another one, and Token Entry, and Youth of Today. Th- those bands, I still understood that some of them represented more positive messages in Straight Edge. Other ones represented a, a little bit more, you know, anger and, and what was going on. And I was drawn to all of that. And I understood all of that because of, of how I grew up, you know, uh, I didn't understand someone who just liked light melodic music or light, light melodic punk rock. I understood why, you yeah, know, 100%. but I, I, I never, I never felt a kinship to that. I felt kinship to, to dudes who are like, 
yeah, you know, these, these are the bands that I liked. And, and if I was, you know, having a checklist, I'd be like, Oh man, yeah, we can, we can talk about that, you know? And, hmm. uh, I, I, I have to go back though to something. It's yeah. like, Lookout Records, Lookout Records was a thing for me. Uh, it was one of the first sort of labels that I discovered that, I, that was on my own, you know, along with Cruise Records, along with SST, right? Yeah. Uh, and Lookout Records, for me, uh, it was Crim Shrine, uh, and it was Aaron Comet Bus, and it was a drummer, and he was writing lyrics, and those lyrics happened to represent, you know, uh, sort of daily life of a modern punk, you know, it's sort of like being isolated and being uh, slightly angry, but slightly, you know, uh, romantic about other times in the past where things were okay. And that truly, the in comic bus for me, that was a personal influence and a personal inspiration that sent me in a, direction and a trajectory that I never would have discovered if it wasn't for him, you know? Yeah. What, so like, I mean, like all this, <coughs> like this, the music that you were listening to was so different that I think than what you guys ended up making. So like, what brought yeah. that on? Like, like how did you guys gravitate towards ska? Well, for us, it was always early on. It was a mesh of screeching weasel a mesh of Operation Ivy and a mesh of uh, Snuff, right? So yep. when I first heard Snuff, I went, here's this fast melodic punk rock, but it has a trombone to it, right? And I remember talking to Chris about it, and me and Chris were like, you know, uh, you know, we're writing songs, and they were kind of like uh, jocking a, a little bit of Screeching Weasel, you know? Yes. Uh but then I was like, dude, like we should do, you know, fast punk rock and we should add this horn section, but we could add, you know, some like, you know, Scott, like, you know, op Ivy and we can kind of, you know, get that, get all of that. If we could push all of that together, that's, that's the winning combination, you know? And that, that's what we set out to do. You know, we set out to be a melodic punk band that had horns, but also dabbled in ska, you know? You guys have always been this. You you have this fun approach to your mar. I mean everything. The like the look of the uh, like the, the look of the marketing. I remember your shows. I went to. I don't want to go too far far forward, but I saw you guys play at Roseland. I think it was like Snowcore or something in '97. And yeah. at the at the end, you guys. I mean, you used to have like a dancing bear on stage, or just guys. People would get dressed up in costumes, and and you know, this is also during Losing Streak and all that. But you guys just had this you brought this extra element of fun to shows Did you, was that just kind of a one show you were playing and just did something funny and you guys were like, we should keep doing that. Or was it, was it kind of like you tripped over that and started going in or you kind of had a vision where you're like, let's make this more interesting for people. Yeah. I mean, we, I, and Chris definitely, he led the charge and the sort of like fun thing. Like he would go around on local shows and go, Hey, like, uh, you know, and go buy all these like crazy, like stuffed animals that were like, you know, 25 cents and 10 cents a piece. He would get, you know, uh, hefty bags full of, of these stuffed animals and we would throw it out. And we just wanted to throw a party every time that we played a show. Okay. And we understood that's what people showed up because they wanted it to be fun. They wanted to be involved. They wanted to leave covered in stuffing from, uh, a stuffed animal from the thrift store and silly string in their hair and, you know, sweaty and beer covered. And that's what we were doing locally. And we started to at least try to replicate that vibe when we were out on tour. Was this around the time that Rocket from the Crypt was touring? Do you, did you, cause I, I, the reason I ask is because you, you might not know, but I mean, they used to literally, when they started playing shows, they would hand out lyric sheets to all their songs to people and say, Hey, you know, here's the songs we're going to play. You can sing along. And they had that theatrical kind of style. Like, did you guys ever hear about that and kind of take some stuff from that? Or does that something that is, there was no alignment there with that? Is it, well, well, Rocket was always uh, been a huge Rocket from the Crypt fan for uh, forever, right? But when that was happening, that was running uh, in, in time frame. Okay. It was running parallel to us. So it wasn't something that we were like, 
oh, Rocket from the Crypt did that. It, it wasn't that at all. The uh, more so for us, it was just, hey, this is this is what we're doing, and this is what this worked locally. So this is what we're going to do while we're out on tour. Okay. How like how did you guys meet Mike Park? I sent him uh, our demo. So you had been following Asian or Dill Records or bands or no, just, we... just just Skank and Pickle. Okay. Skank and Pickle, you know, it's uh, while we were sort of finding what we were doing as far as sound is concerned, you know, uh, Skank and Pickle was just one of those uh, bands that we had picked up on a Friday, you know, and when the weekend was coming, Chris would, you know, go to the record store. I would go to the record store. We would drive down to uh, Tampa to go to Vintage Vinyl to buy punk records. And it was just something that was a review and uh, picked up Skank and Pickle. It was a seven inch and then picked up their full length and just became a band that we really liked. How did you actually? And, oh, sorry. Go on. No, I'm just saying that like there was a point where uh, you find out that, oh, hey, they're releasing their own music. So uh, it just made sense to send something, you know? Did you and ever? Yeah, it wasn't on. about it, it. wasn't about trying to get signed and and put out music through their label. It was more so about getting shows. Okay, so you kind of thought that you'd have more eyes on you if you had someone else just doing the work, and you're like, these guys can put out the records. A lot of people know about them. No, that... no, 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 no. Like, like, like I said, it wasn't about getting signed. It wasn't about anything. It was about. Skank and Pickle was on tour. Skank and Pickle in a lot of places were drawing a lot of people. And we we wanted to play with, with Skank and Pickle. You know, it was a chance to open up for a band that was much bigger than us at the time, you know, in in a lot of places like Arizona and California and uh, Denver and uh, anywhere in the Northwest. They were huge. So, uh it was about sending the demo was, Hey, let's do shows. Here's what we sound like. You know, yeah. if you ever come through Florida, let's play together. If you ever, you know, need somebody to do whatever, then hit us up. It wasn't until, you know, Mike Park had wrote back and said, Hey, you know, we also put out music and maybe we should do something. And I think the first thing was, uh, first thing that we did together was misfits of ska. If my memory serves me correct. What was the process? Um, like getting on the label and like recording Pezcore was it just because I know Mike just does like a handshake deal and so it was just like hey man I'll put this record out you know handshake we're on the label and if you guys ever want to leave that's fine um, but you know here's I don't know how I'm like phrasing this correctly but um, like was it as easy, as it simple as it always, as it always sounds when I hear about Asian Man? Like, he's just like, yeah, like, here it is. This, you know, our contract together is super easy, and I'll take care of the record. You guys just show up and do your shit. Uh, it, you know what? It wasn't even necessarily – it was that, but it was even much looser than that. You know? It Ex was, so hey, explain. You guys, are out doing, you guys are out doing whatever, and I can help put this music out, and – I mean, we paid for the recording of that record. We did, a, you know, all for us, it was uh, just an outlet to get music out, you know, in, in a different scene, you know. Uh, the punk rock scene was completely different to the people that were paying attention to Skank and Pickle at the time, right? Yeah. So, you know, we thought, hey, this is, this is perfect, you know. We can kind of uh, get out into a different audience and maybe they would take us for some more shows and... And, uh, that was, that was really a, a simple thing, you know? And as far as, you know, it started with Dill, uh, it was just a very loose thing. It was, Hey, if you, you know, you have these songs and if you send them to us with some artwork, uh, we'll make CDs uh, and you could sell those CDs out on tour and we will, you know, put some for our mail order and we'll sell some of those CDs at our merch booth as well. So people will know you. Like it was very loose and, and primitive comparatively to what even the bottom basics of modern music is. Yeah. 
Did you guys kind of, like, when Pezcore came out, did you guys think, like, shit, man, like, we really got a solid record here? Or did that kind of peak its head up as soon as you started seeing it just kind of took off? Uh, you know what? We felt good about some of it. And then other things, uh, it was more so what you were just saying. It was the latter. It was, we have this record, and we were out on tour when uh, we first got the, the, the sort of uh, – the CD, right? And uh, it happened to be, you know, around the Midwest and all of a sudden, you know, it, it started to increase exponentially, you know, at that time. So, you know, people started to discover Pezcor and well, the discovery was much harder in the 90s than it is now. Now, if you oh, yeah. mention the band to go and dial it up on Spotify and I can have their whole back catalog at my disposal. But, uh, back then discovery was hard it was about college radio and it was about uh being on tour and it was about zines and it was about you know bigger press and uh just it was kind of wild you know it, it it was wild for me when we were on tour in seattle and there was a bunch of people and i went you know this is blowing my mind how they could figure out who we are they knew who we are. They knew the song. They knew everything about the band. And, and here we were, we were, you know, playing the farthest point in the, the lower 48 from Gainesville as we could. Right. Yeah. And, and people knew who we were and then we're singing songs and singing along. And that, that was blowing my mind because it was, it was hard to find out about bands, you know, and it was, you know, people duplicating tapes and handing tapes off and making, you know, literal mixtapes and, and handing them off of these are the bands that I like and you should check them out. Uh, so it, it, it blew our mind when people showed up. Like you had been touring, was it a solid three years before Pescor came out? Uh, no, I mean, Pescor, Pescor was out. It's 95, right? Or, uh, no, uh, Pescor came out uh, more. It was before that because Losing Street came out in '96. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. So, so I, I can't remember the '93. I think is when Pescor was fully out. Okay, so you guys like when you were doing because you started touring and Pescor came out and you really just toured on that record. Did you start to notice that? Like you said, like kids were showing up in Seattle. Was that on that on those tours when Pezcor's out? We were like, holy shit, these we, we've got like there's like we had five last time, and now there's twenty, and now there's fifty, now there's a hundred. Did you start like w- was it like a consistent um, solid number of p- people that started to show up on certain treks of your of each tour? Uh, you know what? Here, here's the thing, and uh, again, it's like. Uh, it was. It's a little bit more complicated and a little bit more convoluted than just here's Pezcor, right? Right. Because at the same time, we were releasing tons of music, man. Like we were releasing tons of seven inches through and no idea. We were releasing, you know, different tapes and we were flexies and we were on so many comps, you know, compilations at the time of different things and a uh, ten inch through Far Out Records and we were releasing just tons and tons and tons of music between 1992 and 1996 it was crazy how much music we were we were releasing right yeah and i i i really really think that that had a lot to do with people discovering who the band was like cuz in the 90s each label had their own sort of like circle of people that they they appeal to. So no idea had their own crowd of people and, uh, you know, far records had their own crowd of people and Asian man had their own crowd of people. And, uh, every label in between too many records we were on and go uh, dude, literally go down the list. We were on a, a ton. We, you know, I think it's at that time we were over a hundred, you know? Yeah, actually, I, I I forgot about that too because then you guys released Losers Kings and thing Losers King and things we don't understand, and that was basically like a compilation of of all that stuff you'd put out, right? Yeah, 
Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I remember getting that because that was in between, I believe, Pez Core and Losing Streak. So it was like, let's put this all in one place. And then, the ne- you know, then after that, you guys went to Capital and did Losing Streak. But that was on that record, though. Was that pretty much like everything you had put out on compilations and seven inches? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you got to remember, too, during that time, we did the Greased soundtrack, right? Yeah. We did the Slay- Slayer covers, seven inch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there there was a ton, like I said, there was a ton of music that was happening from us. Plus, we were touring a lot. And it was just a, a very cool mix of things that were were happening, you know, and, and go back to what you originally said, and we could kind of seal up that era, right? It's that, you know, our, our live show was becoming extremely potent at that time. You know, we were bringing the party every night. It was, you know, if you didn't leave with Silly String and crazy merch and we were throwing spark guns off the stage and stickers and everything. If you didn't leave with that, then it would have been a weird thing for us, you know? And so we were bringing just the party every night and uh, people were responding to that, but it was the same as, you know, uh, I think, you know, it was just a, a extremely cool combination of, of what was going on, you know, of, of the music that we were listening to, the time, the era, the fact that punk rock, you know, sort of more welcoming and more inclusive, uh, <clears throat> and just the softening of punk rock in general, and and the popularity amongst just uh, uh, pop music, you know. But punk rock was becoming, you know, popular music at that time. It was getting played on the radio. It was beyond the college radio scene that it was relegated to. Yeah. Do you remember? Uh, do you remember Alan Rappaport? He lived in Wayne, and he had you guys play like a luau in his backyard pool party. Yeah, we play. It was a pool party. I remember. That's awesome. I just had to ask that because um, I had Alan. Alan is one of the reasons why me and my friends got into punk rock. I did. I interviewed him um, a couple episodes. Uh, well, it'll be like a lot of episodes before yours. But uh, I, I remember seeing when we started hanging out with him. He introduced us. I think he he might even introduced us to you guys. Um, and, uh, I remember just seeing, he's like, yeah, I did this party and, uh, I had uh, less than Jake play at my pool. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> that was like, it's true. The, it was the coolest fucking thing. And it was like, yeah, around that time. Cause that, that I was listening to you guys and I saw that and I was just blown away that, cause I thought you were just this huge band and I thought it was so cool that you guys would play a, a, like someone's backyard in front of, I think he had like 50 people or a hundred something. It wasn't huge. And then. And then my friend went and saw you guys. I think it was like Allendale and, or I think like Hackettstown. And she brought back pictures to high school and you guys were playing there. And uh, I just, I don't know, there's something about it. I, it was just, it was so cool to me. And that, that's what got me into wanting to tour was seeing pictures of you guys and hearing stories of you guys touring. And that made me like with my band, we were like, it, it, it kind of made me realize I could do it as well. So it was kind of like, how when you guys started off and you know all these bands made it real to you like you guys did the same thing literally did the same thing for me so i was that's just, awesome yeah that, man. and that's the that's, that's the beauty of it man that's the beauty of punk rock music and music in general is that the the you could pass it on the the, the good vibe the, the the dream you could do you could pass it all of that along and that's awesome yeah i just because i just what i what i loved about it was there was a picture, I think, on the back of Pezcor losing streak, where you guys are pushing your van. Yes. And it that, was losers. Yeah, that that made it so real to me. I'm like, wow, these guys are in a van. I want to be in a van. And our vans used to break down all the time, and uh, and it was just yeah. cool because it just made me feel like we were on a level together. Like, man, I could do this too. Um, so okay, a couple more questions. I know you got to go. Um. What did you? It's, how did you guys? Um, how did the Jersey scene treat you guys back then? In uh, New Jersey back then and New Jersey now, it's it's one of the strongholds of of less than Jake, man. Like, uh, it's awesome. Uh, Jersey was always treated us absolutely great, and and being from there, it was a beautiful thing to be treated great by you know a place that you grew up in. That's so fucking cool. <laughs> um, Whose idea was it to do the uh, the hidden track on Losing Streak to have it? I'm not. I won't say where it is. I mean, in case it's people are still looking for it. But whose idea was that? 
You know what? I, I don't know specifically who, but uh, Howie Reynolds, uh, who happens to be on it, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it was just a, a guy who lived in mine and Chris's apartment complex. Like, and That's awesome. he, he had these monologues and he was just a weird and cool dude and like an old, like an elderly guy. Right. And we wanted something fun and we wanted something weird. And we had talked about, you know, secret tracks and, and where to place it and how to do it. And it just happened to be that, uh, that for some reason, Capitol records, which was, you know, losing streak was our first major label record. Uh, they went for this idea, which I couldn't believe, to be honest with you. Yeah, I remember my buddy, Looch, he f- he was the one out of our friends who found it. And I think he, because we were all looking for it for weeks. And uh, I think we were in high school or something. He's like, oh, I fucking found it. And we're like, that's brilliant. <laughs> it was such a it genius idea. Awesome. Yeah, dude, that record, man, I, it's the moment. Oh, my God. Um, what was it? When we got when we got the CD, we put it in. And we were, like, driving around with it. And um, the, the moment I heard automatic, I was just like, holy shit, this, this record's so great. Like, did you guys, did you find that you have like a favorite between Pezcore? I know you guys have so many records, but between Losing Streak and Pezcore, like which of those two do you think, for personally, do you find to be your favorite? Losing Streak for me, because they just, uh, it, it was, you know, uh, it was somebody else's gamble, right? Hmm. It was someone else's going, uh, yeah, we totally believe in your band. Here's what we're going to do. And it, it really is the moment where I think Les and Jake like went beyond just a, a punk rock club, you know, and went into another area, you know, and, and it was awesome, man. It was that, uh, we weren't we weren't following at that time. We were leading at that time, you yeah. know, a, yeah, about totally. musical genre genre bending and things like that. And uh, it was it was a cool feeling to be able to lead that charge musically for the moment, you know. Did that ever stress you out that you guys kind of were like, "Hey, dude, we're now the headliner, and we were packing like ro- you know." For me, I saw you guys in Roseland, which was just thousands of kids. Did you ever just start? You know to what? Get it, it, it should it should it should it should have. Uh, tweaked us out more than it did, right? But at the moment, we were just riding the wave, man, and having a good time, and we weren't succumbing to any pressure because we already knew what we needed to do to continue to be successful. It was the the same thing that we were doing before. It wasn't until much later that you started to kind of go like second guess and have more involvement with tons of other people and those are the influences that started to kind of cloud and muddy the waters a bit, right? Like, mm-hmm. but during Pescor and Losing Streak and Hello Rockview, dude, we were we were riding a massive wave, and it, we were letting the natural sort of magnetic uh, of of the, the the scene and of the moment guide us. It, it, you know, and I'm not trying to say that in a in a weird sort of like oh no. Uh, metaphysical way or anything like that but it it was a massive surge and we were just on it and we weren't worrying about you know anything we weren't worried about radio or mtv we weren't worried about you know headlining and and the pressures and and any of that we were going this was the mission that we had and this was the thing that we were trying to do all along we were trying to get more and more people into the fold and converted to what less than Jake was doing. This was, this was a dream come true, man. This was everything that me and Chris had talked about on his back porch, back in Port Charlotte while we were smoking cigarettes, you know, while his parents were out, this was everything that we talked about. Uh, yeah. That, that's what I loved. Like I just imagine, I just remember being back then and seeing bands like yours and, and looking up to them and just, playing your cds and records on rotate like just over and over and over again and just like that became my en- envisionment like when when we'd go on tour i was like you know i want to be like less than jake like i want to fill a place like they do or i want to just control 
I was like, I love their style because it looks like they just don't give a shit. Like they give a shit, but they, it's like when you come into the room and it's them playing, they're like, this is our space that we're bringing you into and everyone's having a fucking good time. I don't care who you are and we're going to do it our own way. And I always loved that. And I felt like you guys never strayed from that, like ever. No, I mean, dude, it's like later, in, later, like I said, later era, less than Jake. You know, the, the water has got muddied a little bit more because there's a lot going on and there's a lot more people involved at that time. Yeah. But the moment that you're speaking of and the moment that, you know, and beyond, dude, we didn't give a shit. We, yeah. we would laugh. Literally, there's someone from the record label would be, you have to do X, Y, Z or you're never going to get popular or whatever. We would be, we literally laughed in their face and said, <laughs> dude, like, we're doing what we want to do and this is this is what it is so yeah you're right we we cared a ton of uh, uh, we cared about a ton of things and we didn't give a shit about a ton of things yeah and the, and the thing that we, and the thing that we gave a shit about was fans that were showing up making sure that the that they had a great time and we didn't give a shit about what any like anyone really said that was negative because we lived through that you know like we were the outcast of our local scene. We were the outcasts of, you know, punk rock music. We were the butt of the joke at a certain period of time for having a horn section. Like, and we didn't give a shit. Like, you, we had the worst. No one could possibly give us any, anything worse than we already had. And we were succeeding at that time. And we were, like I said, you know, we were making the things that me and Chris had talked about way back when a reality the reality and the dream was happening like uh we didn't care what the naysayer said we didn't care about the neg negativity we didn't care about the suit going you have to do all this stuff uh to be successful we were already successful we were successful the first time we left gainesville and played a show that was being successful to less than jake yeah so Okay, I'm gonna wrap this up. Um, even though I could keep you on the phone for like another two hour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, was there anything you would actually? There's two questions. I'm not sure what you want to do. Um, do you ever like, especially now since you know, literally this week, you, you know, leaving the band and all. Have you done any? Have you ever just looked back on your own sometimes and just been like, "Holy shit, man! Like this is this is wild." Or has it just become so normal that it's it, like you don't do that. Well, I do it sometimes. Uh, I don't do it all the time because that would just be really well, fucking weird. That right? would water if it I down like, too. Uh, and, and, yeah, and just dwelled on it, right? Yeah. Uh, but there's mo there's moments that happen uh, occasionally where I'm reminded of something, of a time, of a place, of whatever, and I get kind of taken back and. and uh, when I come back from like that thought and go, wow, man, that's a lot of cool things have happened and a lot of awesome, very, very, very awesome things have happened to less than Jake and happened to myself and less than Jake allowed me to do a ton of things that I don't know if I would have ever had the chance to do. Right. Yeah. Uh, but to be honest with you, that thought is the same thought that I always had for the last, you know, 27 years, which is, uh, I'm thankful, but I also have to push and continue it. You know, you, you can look back in the past and you can learn from it and you can smile about it. Right. Yeah. But ultimately speaking, you still have to push things forward if you want to continue to do what you do, you know, and I'm thankful for everything and for everyone, but at the same time, uh, that's a lot of fucking hard work that went into into where we're at. It, it wasn't a, a magical sort of, you know, magic wand or a magic spell that got us to where it is. It was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of sacrifice. It was a lot of pushing and pulling to keep things afloat, you know? And... It's good, though, that you could go back in the trying times and look back and go, hell, like we, we worked hard and, and we had success from it. 
you know, and yeah. we had great times and we had good times and, uh, it makes the hard work worth it. So, and sometimes when it's this very weird thing and you feel the most alone and then all of a sudden something happens and you go, well, wait a second, man, like you've done amazing things, snap out of it, pick your ass up, start to work and do and some more push forward. Yeah. And do some yeah. more of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, all right. Is there, it, it, if you could, I don't, I don't even think if you would, but if there was like, if you could go back and talk to yourself 27 years ago when you started this, would there be any little piece of advice you'd tell yourself at all? Like to just be like, Hey, don't do this or like anything you would have slightly changed. You know what? I, the only thing that I would have changed, but also at the same time would have changed the trajectory. Right. I, w I would have told myself to enjoy things more as they go to be present more, you know, hmm. in the present. Uh, but I was always in the future. I was always out. Like, okay. This is cool, but we could do something cooler. Okay. This is cool. Uh, but let's do more. Interesting. And, uh, I don't, I don't know if I if if I went back and told myself to be present more and enjoy it more, uh, if the trajectory would have changed or would have been the same. Uh, but I, I, I'm thinking it would have changed the trajectory of where it was, you know, because my headspace back then and to this day still is. What more can I do? Yeah. Uh, so you can't really be the, the you can't be the person to enjoy it in the present and also be the same person going, okay, that's cool. What about the future? I I, I don't think you could be those two type of pe those two people uh, and exist in the same body. Yeah, I think that's good. If any like younger bands hear this interview, I think that'd be good for them if they're going through it now to like listen to that. And take some of that advice, and then see if they can yeah, balance I mean, that. I, you know, you can't. You can't. You can't be. Bands can't be everything. There's always going to have to be someone who takes up the charge. There's always going to have to be someone who takes up the party. There's always going to be have to have someone who's the face. You know, uh, and there's always going to be have to have someone who's behind the scenes. And very rarely do they encompass the same person yeah occasionally they do but uh, most most of the time they don't yeah um awesome dude uh so before i let you go uh do you want to plug anything you know what man my brothers and less than jake they're out on tour and they're doing whatever it is uh that they do greatly uh i'll be home in gainesville holding down the fort and, and pushing things forward uh less than jake has some cool things planned for november uh, not only shows, but for some merch and for some like limited stuff that we've never done before uh, to kind of swing back around what I just said. Right. So uh, everything's good in the world, man. And be good to each other. That's, that's the most important thing. I'm not going to tell you to vote uh, uh, because I don't know when this is, uh, this, airing, is gonna, this is going to come but, out after all the voting and stuff. So, yeah. So I'm not going to say that, but I am going to say, uh, it's a weird time out there, man. And music is a refuge and a shelter for a lot of people. Uh, and if that's you, enjoy it, man. And uh, be good to each other, man, because you never know what other people are going through at the time. Uh, and kind words go much farther than harsh words or criticism. So be good to each other. Cool, man. Um, I usually end it with what scene ethics do you still hold on to this, to this day? But it kind of sounds like then what you just said is kind of it. Yeah. I, I do the same thing that I did in 1996. I do now. 